Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Richard Digline, and I'll be moderating this first webinar of 2019. I know we are all interested to learn what does the future hold for director compensation. Today we'll hear from executive compensation experts Jan Coors and Tim Dupuy of Pearl Meyer. Jan and Tim lead the research and production of the annual Pearl Meyer NACD Director Compensation Report, which is entering its 20th year. Their extensive data sets and detailed analysis help boards understand year-over-year -year changes, current practices, and emerging trends in director pay. And they have the latest information on board composition, refreshment, and ownership guidelines. We will also be sure to discuss the growing workload and scope of responsibilities directors face and what boards can expect when ISS begins to look even more closely at board pay. Before we get started, Sienna Breen with NACD's education team will take us through the housekeeping notes. Sienna? Thank you, Richard. Audience, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you before we get started. On the right-hand side of your webinar console, you should see three boxes. At the top, you can submit a question to be answered by our speakers during the program, time permitting. If we have a lot of unanswered questions, our speakers may also follow up with you after the program. Please note that if you submit a question, you will be opted in to receive future ex executive compensation thought leadership from Pearl Meyer. Also on the right-hand side of your console, you can tweet live with us using at NACD and at Pearl Meyer. And in the bottom right corner, you can download a copy of today's slide deck, register for our next webinar, and access additional resources. You will automatically receive one NACD skill credit if you participate in this webinar for at least 30 minutes. Credit may be applied to NACD fellowship programs, and you can contact fellowship at nacdonline.org for more information. Please note that this is for the live program only. You can download a copy of today's slide deck through your webinar console or at pearlmeyer.com using the link on your screen. Also, a recording of this webinar will be available early next week at nacdonline.org and pearlmeyer.com. Finally, we will have a few anonymous evaluation questions at the very end of the program, and we would appreciate your feedback, so please stick around at the end of the webcast to answer those questions. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jan to get us started. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, on what for many of you may be a uh, cold winter's day. I am in Chicago, and uh, um, if any of the rest of you are in the Midwest, we've been holed up in our respective houses for two days now. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so let's move on, on to a topic that uh, hopefully can warm our hearts. Um, before we get into the meat of the discussion about director compensation and how we've seen the market change, um, I thought I would set the stage in terms of the database itself and what it tells us about demographics. So like we do every year, we are looking at director compensation data for 1,400 publicly traded companies. So just as a repeat, these are all publicly traded companies. We don't do a survey per se. What we're doing is pulling data from disclosed proxy statements around director compensation. So um, it's, uh, it, we're pulling that data out of publicly sourced information. Um, we take that data then and break it up into five roughly even um, size groups. We've got what we refer to as the micro um, set of companies, which is 50 million to 500 million in annual revenue. We do the breakout by revenue rather than market cap. Um, revenue provides us a little more stable year over year comparison. Market cap, as I'm sure all of you know, can be somewhat volatile. Um, the next size group is what we refer to as the small size group, 500 to a billion dollars in annual revenue. The medium group is 1 billion to 2.5 billion in revenue. Large is 2.5 to 10 billion in revenues. And then the largest 200, the top 200, um, which is greater than $10 billion in revenue. And you'll see the pie charts on the left-hand side of this of the page, which gives you a rough sense of how those company of how that 1400 uh, group breaks up 
<coughs> excuse me, um, in terms of the distribution of the 1,400 companies. We do also try to keep the companies the same year over year so that when we're looking at historical trends over time, that it is tends to be reflective of changes in compensation rather than changes in peer group uh, composition. Obviously, there are always some movement year over year in the companies um, in each of the size categories. Companies grow, companies shrink, there's merger and acquisition activity, um, and certainly in recent years we've seen a number of companies that have been taken private and therefore come out of the database as well. But to the extent possible, we try to keep the peer groups similar um, company over year over year so that as you look at the trends, they are reflective of how companies are actually changing their compensation programs rather than um, simply reflecting a change in the mix. Um, a few words, again, before we, we dive into the compensation level, a few words about company demographics on the board. Uh, median number of directors goes from a small of eight directors to a, at the smallest companies, so those under a billion dollars, um, to a large of 12 directors at the top 200 companies. If you look across all 1,400 firms in aggregate, the median number of directors is nine. Um, over time, as we've seen, there has been a strong push from the governance community to have annual election of directors, so declassified boards where every director is up for re-election every single year. That is almost a universal uh, feature of, <clears throat> of board governance at the largest companies. It is only a little more than half of the smaller companies that have declassified boards. Many of the smaller companies are still doing boards that have classified um, terms. In most cases, those classified terms are rolling three years. So one-third of the board would be up for re-election every year um, and would be then elected to serve a three-year term. The median age for directors has stayed co pretty constant across the spectrum regardless of size. Median age is 64. Um, Interestingly, for the first time in several years, we have seen the median tenure for directors actually start to fall. Um, this year, with the exception of kind of the middle of the pack, the medium-sized companies where director tenure is eight years, the, all of the other um, ten, median tenures are seven years, and that is true of our um, aggregate 1,400 company aggregate as well. If you had looked at the same chart last year, you would have seen that the median tenure ranged from a little over eight years to just over nine years with a 1,400 company aggregate tenure of 8.3 years rather than seven. Um, to me, what this suggests is that companies are starting to react to, again, the external governance push for uh, diversification on the board and, diver and accommodating requests for or, or pushes for additional diversification in terms of board composition is necessitating a little more turnover than what we had seen in the past. Those, ter those tenure numbers had been creeping up year over year for the past several years. This is the first year in a while where we've seen the tenure numbers actually start to come down. So I think that's kind of an interesting trend to watch. Um, <coughs> as a help to um, that turnover to make room for um, a more diversified board structure, um, we look at mandatory retirement. Um, that is the way, to the extent that companies choose to do anything to encourage um, board refreshment, um, U.S. companies tend to 
look to retirement ages as the way to do that rather than tenure. Um, there are some jurisdictions outside of the U.S. when tenure, where tenure tends to be the preferred method of encouraging board turnover. Um, the U.S. has not adopted that by and large in the U.S. where companies do something, they do it through uh, retirement age. Where we see retirement ages, they tend to be between 72 and 75. Again, you see more of it, and it is a more prevalent practice um, the larger the company is. Across all 1,400 companies, um, uh, it runs about 50-50. Half the companies have a, a mandatory retirement, half the companies don't. Um, but their, the prevalence tends to vary pretty significantly based on the size of the company. Um, the last thing we looked at with regard to the composition of the board is we look at board gender diversity. There has been a lot of, uh, a lot in the news lately about um, for gender diversity, particularly with the recent um, legal actions in California about mandating um, at least one woman on boards that are headquartered in California. You'll see here again, um, the majority of companies in our uh, report uh, have at least one woman on their board, but driven very much differentiated by company size. The larger the company, the more likely that there's at least one woman on the board. Um, for anyone who's been in those kinds of discussions around um, gender diversity, we all know that um, one doesn't really help the, the kind of the critical number is three um, for it to really start to feel different. Um, and clearly when you look at <laughs> the number of companies who have two or three um, female members on the board, uh, there's some work to do there. Again, the top 200 companies don't look too bad. Um, as you get smaller, um, the number of women on boards, m multiple women on boards um, is still relatively low. Um, and the last thing on this page around demographics and governance issues is we look periodically, we look every year at the, the prevalence of a combined CEO, chairman of the board function. Um, that is another kind of area that governance um, activists sometimes focus on, a request that those two roles be separated um, despite the focus of activist requests and pressure on that issue. Um, companies have largely um, resisted the, the um, push to separate those two roles. In fact, again, if you had looked at this chart last year, you would have seen that the prevalence for the 1,400 companies for a combined CEO, chairman of the board role was 43%. It has in fact dropped this year. So instead of it being 43%, it's now down to 36%. So clearly um, companies feel comfortable making the case that despite governance activist pre um, prevalent preferences on this issue, that companies seem to be um, more comfortable making the argument that there's a rationale for the combined um, CEO, chairman of the board function. Um, I'll turn it over in a second to uh, Tim to start to walk us through the pay issues. But Richard, I'm just curious kind of if there was anything on this page that jumped out as, at you as being interesting or not what you expected. Uh, n not particularly. I, I'm not surprised by much of any of it. There is one question, though, from our participants asking about what the trends are in uh, ethnicity. Um, it, here, I will honestly, I will have to speak anecdotally um, because, again, as I said earlier, you know, we're, when we're doing this analysis, um, we're doing it on the basis of, of publicly disclosed documents. We're not doing it on, 
through any kind of survey instrument where companies give us information. Um, and, you know, ethnicity is a harder thing to get to um, in any kind of an accurate way. Um, then gender, I would say just anecdotally, as I, you know, as you look through things, it, it seems to be improving um, like gender diversity is improving, um, although my guess is if you were to actually um, do self-reported um, ethnicity through a survey instrument, and looked at the data, you would find that the ethnicity numbers were probably lower than the gender diversity numbers are. Okay. So a long way to a long way to go on that score as well. Yeah, my sense over uh, the years is that there is more of an effort on the part of a lot of boards to bring uh, minority representation onto their their board structure, but. Again, uh, that's just my personal experience uh, with several boards that I've been on. Okay, and with that, let me turn it over to Tim to walk us through, start us down the path of compensation. Great, so over the next several slides, we're gonna go through some of the year-over-year the -year changes and some of the prevalency numbers that we're seeing in terms of the, the director compensation packages. And so this first slide really looks at the, the total direct compensation uh, change year over year that, that we see within our report. Uh, and so when we think about total direct compensation, that is really the entire uh, compensation that is received by a director. So annual cash retainer, uh, board meeting fees if they exist, committee compensation, equity awards, et cetera. Uh, so for this year, if we look across all firms, uh, we see a 2% increase uh, relative to the prior year. Um, and this is really, you know, fairly similar to the increases that we've, we've really seen over the past 5% years. Uh, you'll see in the micro companies, we saw a 3% decrease uh, in total compensation. And <clears throat> this is likely an anomaly. Um, as Jan mentioned before, you know, when we pick the participants in the surveys, we try to get an equal number of companies in each size bucket. Um, we saw a larger turnover year over year in the micro size companies than we typically do. Um, there was a lot more uh, M&A activity, bankruptcies, um, and you know organizations going private than we typically see. And so I, I suspect that 3% decrease is, is an anomaly there. Um, within all other groups, you know, comp total direct compensation was was very modest. So, you know, remain flat in the median companies and one to two percent in the other size groups. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what these numbers look like next year. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk among a lot of the committees that we work with about an increased workload. Um, and so, while I suspect these numbers will remain relatively similar next year, um, given increased workloads and uh, additional scrutiny around board pay, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what these numbers look like. When we take a deeper dive and look at year-over-year um, -year changes by each compensation element, uh, there's really a few things that, that stick out. Uh, cash retainers overall uh, increased by 6% um, across all organizations. Uh, the largest increases coming from <clears throat> sorry, from small organizations at 16%. Uh, I would suspect that these increases were likely made to offset some of the decreases that you see in board meeting fees and committee compensation, or sorry, committee meeting fees. Um, board meeting fees uh, decreased by 13% across all firms. And to us, this really indicates that companies are really continuing to streamline their director compensation programs um, and eliminate meeting fees. And while these percentages uh, appear fairly significant, it's also important to note that these meeting fees generally make up the smallest part of the overall director compensation package. Um, so while the percentages are, are large, the, the dollar impact is probably uh, rather minimal. 
committee compensation levels uh, also dropped across all size organizations. And once again, this kind of affirms the, the, the trend over the past several years that companies continue to remove committee meeting fees and they're offsetting this by increasing uh, the annual cash retainer. The one other element that I'll point out here would be total direct compensation per meeting. Um, that increased uh, across uh, all size organizations, um, which was which was a bit surprising since we've been hearing from many organizations that there's been an increased workload recently among committee meetings. Um, and so once again, this is this is another area that I'll be interested to see what these numbers look like for 2018 compensation, as many of the committees we're working with uh, have indicated that that workloads, especially at uh, the, the committee level have uh, increased over the past year. Yeah, and I think importantly here, um, just uh, for purposes of um, kind of explaining that, that kind of total direct, that total compensation per meeting, I mean, it's not like that's a, a number that companies are managing to or anything like that. That's kind of a derived calculation that we do after the fact um, just as a just to kind of get a sense of you know have is is compensation um, increasing with the workload keeping up with the workload I think part of what drives that and here again uh, Richard I'd be interested in your thoughts um, I think part of what might be driving that is that my sense anyway is that so much of what board members report as, report as increased time commitment and workload is less, isn't necessarily taking place in formal meetings as much as it is mm -hmm. taking place in what they view as the things they have to do as a sole board member to stay up to date, to stay engaged, to do homework research, you know, additional education, um, rather than their calendars are getting clogged up with a lot of formal structured meetings. I think, Jan, that it can be both. It depends a lot on, on the company's circumstances. I know I was on one board that managed to have 21 f formal, 21 directors meetings in one year, but we were going through a lot of significant change and mergers and some acquisitions and so on. Uh, I think that's pretty unusual. But I do believe that there is a lot more time spent away from formal meetings just to make sure that you're staying up to speed with what's really going on in whatever the industry may be or what's going on with competitors. Uh, and it takes a lot of time and you can't just go into a board meeting and and think you're going to be up to speed to have any kind of meaningful input if you don't understand what's happening with the competitive set and with the industry in general. I think that makes a lot of sense. So that leads us to our first polling question, and, and it's really an area that's popped up fairly frequently uh, over the past year, especially from some of our global clients that have, you know, directors traveling uh, to and from meetings, you know, all over the world. Um, has your organization provided special pay or enhanced travel allowances for directors that fly across the globe for meetings? Uh, yes, no, or it has been discussed, but no action has been taken yet. And so, Richard and Jan, I know uh, you both in particular have, this has uh, been an issue, so I'd be interested in your thoughts. Well, again, my experience has been that as, as companies have become more and more global, there is clearly uh, the possibility in many cases, the probability that you're going to be required or requested to go to meetings in some other country uh, where you have major presence. Uh, I, my own perspective on that is, and quite honestly, is that if you go on to a board or you're on a board that becomes much more global, that's what you should expect to happen, and you should look at that, at least I would, look at that as opportunities to expand your own experience and knowledge uh, 
and to bring more benefit to the board that you're sitting on. So in my case, I never expected to get paid extra for that. Uh, I just took that as part of this company's, uh, you know, platform or foundation, and that's what I signed on to be involved with. Hmm. You know, I, th I think it has you know, clearly, as you think about how boards are looking at meeting that um, increased diversity um, expectation from shareholders and investors, um, global diversity is one of those factors. Um, I think it has, it, it has an impact on how companies think about how realistic it is um, as you start to look at the mix, not just of, of kind of geographic dispersion of your directors, but also um, currently employed versus, um, versus retired directors. I think, you know, it becomes increasingly challenging um, when you've got a board full of sitting CEOs to expect them to take, you know, four days out or to, by the time they travel and do board meetings in another country and then travel back home again, um, that can put a strain on your board members if they are sitting executives. So I think there's there's a lot of different kind of layers to this issue. Um, there, you know, clearly we we see some companies look at whether or not they should have some kind of um, incremental per diem compensation for um, for non particularly for non U.S. directors. Who are who get stuck ending up doing the lion's share of the traveling relative to U.S. Um, directors for U.S. headquartered companies. You know, it's one thing when everybody's doing the traveling, um, but if you've got you know one or two directors who have to travel to 75% of the meetings versus just that one meeting a year, um, it can be a bit of a strain. Yeah, I have two. One of your points, Jan, in that in that regard also is that I think as there is more of this required of directors of doing international travel, uh, that it becomes more and more difficult to, in fact, get a sitting CEO of another company to be willing or able to join your board. If they see that you're going to have, you know, two, three, or four different meetings that may be, you know, really distant uh, and require a lot of time, that may preclude their ability to be a participant. Yeah. So, Tim, let's see what everybody says. All right. Let's see the results. So it looks like uh, about 70% of you said um, no, there Captain, hasn't yeah. been <clears> – <throat> any uh, special uh, pay actions made. 20%, uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised that it's that high, um, you know, have made enhanced travel allowance or special pay for, uh, you know, enhanced travel. And then about 10%, uh, it has been discussed, but no action taken yet. An interesting, maybe small, but side question on this is what, do you see as the view, or do you see any trends in terms of if you are requiring your directors to do this kind of travel, what do you have as a consideration for first class or coach or whatever? Uh, oh, no, we definitely, I would, yeah, I would definitely, I would say we definitely see, um, you know, the last thing you want as, as an executive is, is a room full of grumpy directors because you've made them sitting <laughs> coach. Um, so, so I would say at a minimum you would expect that um, that directors are flying, you know, business class, first class, something, you know, or, and or on the company plane, um, depending on the company. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that that part of it almost goes without saying. I think. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Right. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to go through these next slides fairly quickly just because we have just about a half hour left and we want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, right here we're looking at the mix of pay elements 
Um, and, and really no surprise here, over the past several years, full value stock continues to make up the largest portion of total pay. Uh, the, focus, the focus on equity usage uh, increases with company size, um, and really within all size companies, uh, with the exception of micro companies, uh, equity makes up at least 50% of the total pay package. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, uh, board meeting fees and committee pay uh, remain the smallest portion of, of total compensation for directors. Uh, as we all know, if, if you've been <clears throat> participating in, in this webinar over the past several years, uh, it's an NACD best practice or leading practice uh, for organizations to provide at least 50% of director compensation in the form of equity. And so on this slide, we're looking at uh, the prevalence of companies that, that follow this practice. Um, you know, when we look at small, medium, large, and top 200 companies, uh, about 69% or more of these companies uh, follow that practice and provide at least 50% of total compensation in the form of equity. Um, about 55% of, of micro companies do. Uh, and really over the past several years, uh, this prevalence has increased uh, year over year across all size categories. Um, when we look at the prevalence of organizations granting either restricted stock uh, slash full value shares or stock options, uh, full value shares uh, remain the, the preferred vehicle. Um, and this, this has really been true since the, the, mandatory of, the mandatory expense of stock options uh, came to fruition. And, you know, the common rationale out there right now is that full value shares uh, really create a stronger alignment between director and shareholder interests with the idea that board members, uh, their key responsibilities are, are more focused on company oversight and governance. Yeah, here I would, I, would, I would simply add that, you know, if you were to look at kind of the prevalence of full value shares versus, versus options for this same group of companies, and what they did for their executives, you would not see this kind of mismatch. But the rationale here is, uh, you know, as Tim says, the point, the purpose of giving um, equity to directors is less about having performance-based compensation. It's more about providing that sense of stock ownership and alignment with the shareholders that they represent. So critical that, you know, from an ownership perspective in creating that sense of, of, um, of equity participation that the restricted stock um, better fits that purpose. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if, you know, when we take a, a slightly deeper dive into those organizations that do provide stock options in, to their directors, uh, it's generally an industry's that rely heavily um, on providing stock options to their executives. So think, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, the high-tech industry, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I know we're going to cover this in a minute, but I think also one of the things that uh, is, is, from my perspective, really important is that it's great to give full-value restricted stock kind of equity to directors. I think it's absolutely critical that they are required to hold a certain amount, either dollar value, whatever, until they actually retire from the board. So it's not an opportunity for them just kind of jump in and jump out, jump in and jump out and still stay on the board. I think they need to hold that equity for the period that they're there. Yep, and we are going to um, cover stock ownership guidelines yep. in, a, in a few slides. Yep. So when we think about looking at how companies grant the equity, uh, there's really two different types of approaches. Uh, there's a fixed value approach, which means that each year um, a consistent dollar value in equity is delivered to the directors. Uh, you know, for example, a company might state that each year a director is granted $30,000 worth of equity. Uh, then there's a fixed share approach, which uh, is, is the the, the opposite. So each year a consistent number of shares is granted to each executive. Um, the, the predominant approach still remains 
uh, a fixed value approach um, with the common thought there that using a fixed value approach similar to what Jan said before is more consistent with the director's responsibilities uh, and confirms that you know most organizations still believe that a director's service uh, isn't more or less valuable due to changes in the stock price. And interestingly, there tends to be, again, if you were to kind of dig deeper um, into this data, what you would find is that the companies that rely on fixed, uh, that use restricted stock are more likely to use, to take a value-based approach to their annual equity grants and the companies that grant options are more likely to take a share-based approach. Yeah, the, the one other thing that I'll point out on this page is when we look at the prevalence of using a fixed value approach, we did actually see this prevalence increase um, across all size categories. Um, and I suspect that, that that's due to some of the increased uh, volatility in the stock market uh, over the past couple of years. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I suspect that organizations want to uh, have a less volatile approach into, you know, how they're paying their directors. Well, and again, as, well, as um, you know, as there's been in the, pa in the paper recently, um, issues around IFS paying closer attention to director compensation, you know, concerns about um, litigation over director compensation, the fixed value approach, your a company is far less likely to find themselves inadvertently um, outside the competitive kind of median around compensation. The One of the dangers of a fixed share approach is that you can find yourself based on volatility in your stock price, you can find those values swinging pretty wildly from year to year. Um, and so you may find it, that you have, you're all of a sudden out of step with your peer group in terms of the level of compensation. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. When we look at the prevalence of committee meeting fees, <clears throat> and this is really a trend we've seen over the past several years, uh, we're seeing the prevalence of providing committee meeting fees to both chairs and members uh, declining really across uh, all size organizations, across all of the, the three typical committees that, that we see on boards. And once again, you know, this just indicates that, you know, there's the, the movement continues for, for organizations to uh, streamline their, their programs by eliminating meeting fees. Uh, and as I mentioned before, more often than not, you know, the offset of eliminating these meeting fees is, is an increase to uh, annual cash retainers. When we look at uh, the compensation paid to uh, the chairs of each of the, the three standing committees, um, you know, universally, you know, we continue to see that the audit chair continues to be the highest paid uh, <clears throat> committee chair, followed by the comp committee chair, um, and then followed by the chair of the nominating governance committee. Uh, the levels that you see here uh, in terms of dollars are pretty consistent with levels that, that we've seen last year. Um, you know, I'd be interested on, on your thought, Jan, here, um, but I've seen movement in some of the committees that I work with over the past year or so where it seems like the comp committee chair and the audit committee chair, you know, they might be coming uh, a little bit more closely paid than, than this data might suggest. Yeah. You know, I, it's interesting because, you know, if you think back over the, you know, 20 odd years that we've been doing this report, um, you know, it, it used to be that committees, you, everybody was kind of paid the same, regardless of which committee it was. You got money, you got X amount of money for sitting on the board. You got Y amount of money for sitting on a committee. Um, and over time, you know, we had Sarbanes Oxley come in, and so we had to pay the audit committee more. And then comp committees got 
more complicated, focus on executive pay. So then we had to pay the comp committee a little bit more, but not as much more as the audit committee. And so over time, we have migrated from what used to be back back in the day, a very flat um, committee compensation structure to kind of a committee structure that is currently kind of three-tiered. Um, and I wonder, to your point, if we aren't starting to see a kind of, you know, a return to the past where there is less different, increasingly less differentiation in those committee fees, um, you know, again, and for example, even if you look at the top 200 as kind of the bellwether for driving, you know, norms, audit or comp and non-gov are now equal um, instead of there being that kind of third tier. Um, and there's only that $5,000 difference to, to audit committee. And I would agree with you, Tim, that I'm starting to see some pushback as to whether or not that audit comp, um, whether or not that audit comp differentiation is continues to be warranted given what falls on the comp committee's plate. Um, and starting to see some pushback as to whether or not that third, that kind of third tier, you know, redheaded stepchild tier for the NOMGov committee, it continues to be warranted mm -hmm. given the pressure that NOMGov is under around um, succession planning and diversity on boards and other governance issues. Um, so long-winded answer, but I think we may be, the pendulum may be swinging back to where we were 20 years ago when committees all kind of got paid the same thing. Yeah, I think part of what drove that, and I still think does, is that at least my experience is that when you are on the audit committee, you end up spending rather considerably more time than even the compensation. And certainly historically, a whole lot more than governance. Now, what you just said, yeah. I agree with you that the pressure that's coming on governance and compensation uh, is tending to flatten that out. But I still believe that it it takes rather considerably more time and effort to be a member of the audit committee than it does the other two. That's my opinion. I think there's a lot of audit committee members that would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> agree. <laughs> So before we get into our second polling question, uh, we have a very similar slide here that just shows uh, the compensation that is paid to, uh, or the retainers that are paid to members of each committee uh, follows a very uh, similar pattern to what we see uh, for pay levels for the chairman. Uh, audit committee remains the most highest paid, followed by the comp, followed by the nominating gov. Um, <clears throat> You know, not so interesting anymore as we saw this happen a few years ago uh, within top 200 companies, uh, more than 50% of those companies do not provide uh, <clears throat> member retainers uh, for their compensation committee members or their nominating and governance committee members. And leading us to our poll question number two, um, and, and we've talked about this a, a little bit through throughout the webinar webcast so far, uh, we've talked about increased workloads, um, specifically given the idea that uh, board meeting fee retainers and, or, and committee meeting fee retainers uh, have been reduced in, in prevalence over the past several years. Uh, has your organization provided additional compensation for extreme workloads or service on special or ad hoc committees recently? Yeah, you know, I think this is um – you know, an interesting juxtaposition given where the market data is, which is, you know, companies looking to streamline um, particularly their committee pay to get rid of, rid of meeting fees, if not get rid of um, committee retainer, committee compensation altogether for everybody but the, um, but the chair position. Um, then kind of what do you do when you find yourself in a situation where the workload is substantially more than what was originally anticipated? Um, I know I've had several um, clients uh, in recent years who have 
kind of created a bit of a caveat in their structure to say something along the lines of, we, we don't have meeting fees unless there are more than eight meetings a year. If there are more than eight meetings a year, then we add for that, you know, ninth meeting plus, we'll add, you know, $1,000 a, meet, a, a meeting or something like that. But they sort of anticipate in advance, here's what happens if the unexpected happens, um, rather than trying to go back and fix it after the fact, which I think is just a little more optically awkward. Um, Richard, what have you seen? I think the, uh, the, the thing that I have seen quite a bit of is when an ad hoc committee gets set up, for example, a company's going into a major uh, merger acquisition mode, uh, I think it's quite normal for them to create a committee that's going to spend special time working with the management group and focusing on that acquisition. And in those situations, most of the time, I've seen compensation paid for that kind of unusual one-off kind of a, of a commitment. Um, so in the interest of time, Tim, let's take a look at our answers. Okay. So uh, roughly a little more than a third um, have provided additional compensation for extreme workloads. A little more than half have not. Um, and the remaining percentage, um, you know, it's been discussed, but no action. And I, I tend to agree with, with Richard for some of ad hoc committees that, that come up and there's an expectation that there's going to be a lot of work there, whether it's M&A activity or, um, you know, a, a CEO search. You know, I've certainly seen uh, extra compensation provided to members that, that serve on those committees. And, Jan, I will turn it over to you. The last couple of points we want to touch on um, are the compensation for the leadership of the board, whether that be the non-executive chairman of the board position or the um, lead director, presiding director role. Um, and over time, as, those, as these positions have become um, more prevalent and more consistent, we've started to see the pay kind of level itself out into um, some typical patterns. Um, as you'll see here, uh, by, uh, you know, by size category, when you look at the median uh, at board leadership pay as a multiple of the member total direct compensation, the non-executive chair position is typically getting somewhere around 50% more in the form of additional compensation. Oftentimes for the chair, for the chairman of the board position, that additional compensation is delivered in, the, in a combination of additional cash retainer and additional equity award because um, it is a fairly sizable premium. Um, so typically what you would see is a company would kind of just bump up both the, both the cash retainer for the board service as well as the annual equity grant. For the lead or lead director or presiding director, the premium is a little smaller. It tends to be roughly, you know, 12, 12, 13 percent more um, in those cases because the premium isn't quite as large relative to the typical director. Those premiums tend to be more often delivered 100 percent in cash rather than a combination of cash and equity. So you would typically just see that they would get that the lead director would get the same annual equity grant as every other board member, but would get an additional cash retainer similar to the additional cash retainer that any of the committee, the standing committee chairs would receive. But those premiums tend, whether it's the chair, chair position or the lead director, those premiums tend to be pretty consistent regardless of company size. Um, the last point we want to touch on is stock ownership guidelines. We talked about the um, typical equity structure a little earlier in the presentation. The majority of companies, um, even to the, to the micro companies, now have some form of stock ownership guideline in place for their non-employee directors. Um, 
again, the prevalence of stock ownership guidelines tends to increase with company size so that when you get to the top 200, it's vir virtually universal. Um, the smallest set of companies we look at, it's just over 50% that have instituted formal ownership guidelines. Guidelines are most commonly set as a multiple of the board retainer, so they typically don't include the cash that a member would receive by virtue of committee assignments, but they would be a multiple of the cash retainer for board service. They typically wouldn't include meeting fees either if, a, if the board tends to have meeting fees. So one of the things to think about as you look at um, potentially changing your pay structure to either get rid of meeting fees by rolling those into the cash retainer or getting rid of committee compensation by rolling that into the board cash retainer is to just not forget that that will tend to have an impact on the level of stock that you require your directors to hold if your structure is to, is um, set up in a typical way and is tied to board to the board retainer. Um, You'll see that while the retainer tends to be a pretty common, you know, four or five times um, that multiple, the value of what that means in terms of the amount of equity that a director is expected to have and hold on to through um, their tenure on the board increases with size since the cash retainer increases with size and runs from just under $200,000 at median for the smallest micro companies to half a million dollars at median for a top 200 company. Um, and with that, in our remaining few minutes, we want to move to kind of our last polling question. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that, you know, we are seeing ISS suggest that they are going to increase their scrutiny of director compensation, um, including kind of developing some sort of a standard for what they determine to be, quote, excessive unquote, director compensation. And so we're wondering the extent to which com people on the phone have looked at, I, at um, enhancing your proxy disclosure um, in order to better disclose the rationale or, and methodology um, behind your director compensation. Right now, disclosure in this area is pretty pro forma. Um, I don't think anybody's looking, you know, relishing the idea of making proxy statements even longer than they already are, but right now there's pretty scant um, disclosure for most companies about why they pay people um, directors the way they do or how they set that pay. Um, so we're wondering whether or not um, this ISS uh, scrutiny is making any of you rethink that. Yes, no, not yet, but we plan to. It, again, I sort of, you know, I sort of set forth, you know, my thoughts on this. I, I have, I think that, um, you know, there is certainly room. I think companies have made great strides in terms of um, explaining not just the how and the how much, but the why of director compensation, of executive compensation in their proxy statements. I'm not sure we've done nearly as good a job of doing, of explaining the why with regard to director pay. Um, so I think there's definitely some room for improvement on that score. But um, Richard, what's your sense? Do you yeah. do you feel as you think about your boards? Do you feel like um, that's an area you guys think about, worry about? Yeah, I'm not sure we think about it very much or worry about it, except in terms of how much are we getting paid to do it. Uh, and I <laughs> I really think that what you you've said in terms of disclosure, there really is very very little. And I think there is a tendency for people to look at this two or three hundred thousand dollar a year uh, compensation package that is fairly prevalent in a number of of instances of saying, boy, that's that's a heck of a lot of money for going to four meetings a year or whatever it is. I think it would be very helpful if there was some succinct kind of dialogue about 
what the real number of meetings are and how many committee meetings you really do have and what kind of time commitments are made uh, to go to those meetings. I mean, it's not just going mm-hmm. to a board meeting. It's very often, a, you know, a day in each direction to get there. Uh, and, and and there's a lot more time involved in being on that board and being effective on that board than uh, I think is generally understood. And in some articulate, succinct writing about that, I think it would be very helpful. Interesting. Well, you know, certainly as I look at as we look at the polling results, it suggests that you know about a, a little over a third of um, our folks have done some sort of enhanced disclosure. Um, just under half haven't done anything yet, and the remainder are thinking about it. Um, you know, I think this is an area we'll see how ISS plays out, and whether or not other institu- uh, whether or not institutions sort of get on that bandwagon. I think this is going to be an interesting area area to watch over the next couple of years. Yeah, I um, agree. So with that, let me just um, wrap this up in terms of, you know, if we had to say what we're seeing is the key trends, um, modest annual inc- in- increases year over year, uh, again, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we're going to see mid-single-digit increases at median year over year. Um, <coughs> That's been the trend the last several years. I see nothing that suggests that that will change. Um, I think we will continue to see um, the simplification and streamlining of compensation um, around eliminating meeting fees, eliminating committee, you know, maybe seeing a, a decrease in the differentiation between different types of committees, which would again, um, facilitate rolling committee compensation into board comp- into board retainers, but I do think that increasingly we're going to see companies try to figure out how do we manage that if we do that streamlining approach. How do we manage the um, the unintended or extraordinary workload for people, and also how do we manage um, extraordinary other issues like the travel issue for global uh, directors that we talked about earlier in our presentation. We'll continue to see a focus on equity over cash for public company boards. We will continue to see companies push the institute um, ownership guidelines. Obviously, the largest companies already vast majority have them, but we'll continue to see the prevalence of ownership guidelines at smaller public companies continue to rise to meet those higher prevalence levels. Um, And, you know, obviously we'll see what happens as ISS starts to come up with more specific guidelines and standards around what they deem director compensation, appropriate director compensation to be and the extent to which that will play into, um, into issues and, and overall compensation structures. <laughs> 